um, we can jump into more of a little bit of a technical talk actually. Uh, I'd like to welcome Runa and uh, this is going to be a talk about uh, having privacy in mind when building or developing uh, mobile or uh, web apps. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Runa Senvik and uh, my talk is about secure development. Uh, I'm going to cover some privacy aspects later uh, but I wanted to start with the security. Um, so I'm going to start talking about where um, the application development lifecycle and where security fits in. And I'm going to cover some of the most common web application vulnerabilities, so SQL injection and cross-site scripting, um, and, and what you can do to ensure that your application is secure from the beginning, so from the planning phase. Um, the examples that I'm going to show are, uh, they may seem to be very web application specific, but they're actually generic enough to cover mobile apps as well. So the picture here is one way to kind of illustrate the, the application development lifecycle and how you start with the idea of a project. So say you have like a website, you want to create the new Twitter, for example, then you need to define what, is, what exactly is it that your web service is going to do? How will it be different from Twitter? Um, what will the users be able to do? What kind of access do they need? Um, yeah, so what the purpose of it is, uh, how it competes with similar services on the market. So in this case, how does your new service compete with Twitter? Um, and so before you move on to designing and building this application, you will have a very clear idea of exactly what it is that you're going to do. Um, and ideally, security and also the privacy aspects of your application or, or your service should be a part of the define and design phase of the project. It's not something that you can just add on top later. Um, attempting to actually implement important security features at a later stage, so let's say once you've actually deployed it, is probably going to take you more time and end up costing you a lot more money than if you had incorporated into the uh, planning phase. Um, so to give you an example, one of the services that I use, um, so it's, a, it's a web service. Um, it has gotten quite popular over the past couple of years. They did not start with SSL. In the beginning, users could not connect on, and, and log on to this website using SSL. Um, I'm not sure why they decided that that was not important, but they did. Um, and then a couple of years later, they wanted to implement SSL, and they realized that because they had, um, they had external resources, they had load balancing, they had multiple servers, it actually took them two weeks and two developers to get it done. And that's time and money that they could have spent had they actually thought about security from the beginning. So how many of you have heard about the uh, Open Web Application Security Project? Some. Okay, so uh, OWASP is a documentation project mainly uh, that kind of aims to provide doc documentation, standards, libraries, uh, and APIs that kind of help you write secure ap applications kind of from the ground. Um, they also have a checklist for security in mobile app applications, um, things to consider when creating a web service or a mobile app. Um, and so some of the things that I'm going to go through here are also covered in the uh, OWASP top 10 list. So I think every, every year or so, they publish a list of top 10 security vulnerabilities, uh, things that they see uh, pop up time and time again. Um, and uh, the top two are always SQL injection and XSS. So how many have heard about SQL injection and XSS? So, okay. So SQL injection and XSS are, as I said, the most common web security vulnerabilities. Uh, it's basically use of untrusted data in the construction of SQL statements and HTML snippets. So it's kind of any, any application that takes user input just because you feel that your app or because your app application expects a number doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the user is going to put in. So that's 
how to identify C SQL injection in code and XSS in code. Um, basically, if you have any, any line of code that takes user input directly and then uses this in uh, SQL query or in any HTML snippet that is then printed back out to the user, will be vulnerable to this. So why is this bad? Why, why, why do these things pop up as like the number one and number two on the list? So the first example shows um, Alice visiting example.com. Um, she's a legitimate user. The application expects her to input a number that is her ID, and so she sees only her own records. In the second example, uh, Bob, instead of putting in a, in a number, puts in something and then or one equals one, which is true, which means that he sees all records from the database. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do with uh, SQL injection. You can see all records. You can uh, drop all tables in the database. Um, you can also just take over the whole host and do whatever you want, read all records, print all records, and so on. This is a uh, second example, more on the um, XSS. Um, XSS will allow you to do a lot of different things. It's, it's basically HTML that is printed back out to the user. So you can use it to just give the user like a pop-up box. That's kind of the most standard example. You can steal their cookies so that you can later log in as them. Um, you can send them to a different website and so on. So how to prevent it? Um, SQL injection and XSS, like I said, may occur uh, anywhere where users are allowed to post data. So any input field in your mobile app, in your web service, or whatever it is, um, you will need to check to make sure that, that the value that the users put in aren't kind of put directly into a SQL query. Um, the uh, OWASP project does have some, some APIs that try to help you do this in like a safe way. Uh, you can also validate it by having like a, like a whitelist. Um, it's, it's, it's not the best way to do it, but it's, it's kind of like an, it's, it's something. Um, you can say, for example, that only uh, digits are, are allowed if, if users can only, if it's kind of ID equals something, then saying any, any digit is allowed, any character is not allowed. That's kind of an easy way to do it as well. Um, authentication and session management. Um, so credentials, so your username, your password, uh, and session ID, so the cookie, uh, should be protected when stored and should not be easily guessable. Um, if, if my username is, is Runa and my password is Runa, then that's not secure. Um, so the, cause the last thing you want is for an attacker to kind of easily guess the username that you have or the cookie that you're going to use or if the cookie doesn't expire after a certain amount of time or it doesn't expire once you've logged out. Um, that's a bad idea. Session IDs as well should not be exposed in the URL. Um, I've seen that a number of times where you get to the website, you log in, and then the URL changes to something.com slash session ID equals string. Um, a session should always time out after a period of inactivity, um, especially banking. Um, you will see, I think, somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes is like a sane value to put. Uh, users should be able to successfully log out of the application and not log back in by clicking the back button. Um, passwords, session IDs, and other credentials should only be sent over an encrypted connection. I'm going to come back to that later on. but. Um, Sensitive data requires encryption also when stored on disk. Um, so that kind of comes back to like the, the planning phase of your project. When you plan what, what kind of data should your application store, then also kind of try to figure out what, kind, what data is actually sensitive. If you're storing passwords, credit card information, 
health records, personal information, anything that, that, that you wouldn't want to have leaked to the internet, you should make sure that you store it securely on disk, in backups, in transfer, and everywhere it's actually used. Uh, passwords should be hashed with a strong standard algorithm, um, so not, not in clear text, not using just MD5. Uh, use a strong algorithm and use like an appropriate salt as well. Uh, transfer layer protection or SSL. Um, use SSL to protect all traffic if possible. Um, that's something that Google and Twitter are doing now. Um, once you log on to Twitter, all of your traffic is over SSL. Um, that may seem a bit, I guess, extreme for some sites. Not, not all sites can have SSL on every single page. So at the very least, use SSL to protect authentication related things um, and any resources on kind of private pages and, and services. Um, all session cookies should have the secure flag set to make sure that your browser doesn't transmit them in the clear. Um, it doesn't really help to use, uh, to kind of have a somewhat secure site if you're not transferring the session cookie securely. Um, the servers, the certificate should be legitimate and properly configured. Um, the fact that the CA model is somewhat broken is a bit of a different topic, but you should try to have a certificate that is actually valid. Um, use of SSL should be by default. Uh, like I said, that's something that Google and Twitter are doing. Um, now it's something users need to opt in to use. Facebook, for example, you need to go into your account settings page and you need to actually tick a box that says, I want to use SSL. It's not something that actually just happens. I'm not sure that Yahoo actually even gives you the option of using SSL these days. Um, access control. Um, just because I'm not logged in as the admin user does not mean that I can't access the admin page if you haven't restricted the URL. Uh, in some cases, you, you can, for some pages, you can actually log on as your normal user and then if you know the actual the full URL to the admin page, then you can actually browse it. Um, so you need to kind of verify every single page of your application, of your mobile app, and make sure that users can't access it without the proper authorization. So there are, uh, has anyone heard of Burp Suite? It's a one. Uh, there's, it's, it's kind of like a, a framework slash platform written in Java that kind of helps you um, review your application, make sure that you have the proper checks in place, make sure that the session cookie is actually transferred uh, securely and that it's actually, um, I guess, random enough, uh, that it's not easily guessable, and so on. Uh, so that's a great tool to use. So just because your application is secure doesn't mean that people can't break in. Um, general housekeeping rules would be to make sure all software is up to date. So operating system, web server, application, code libraries. The more libraries you use, um, I guess the, the bigger the risk is that sooner or later something's gonna be out of date and you won't know. Um, disable what you don't need. So ports, services, accounts, uh, privileges. Um, in this case, it might also be good to have, especially in, in you'll, you'll see this in bigger companies, they, they have a policy for what to do when someone leaves. They will change the password, they will change any default password that that person had uh, knowledge of, um, and so on. Um, proper error handling to prevent stack traces from, from leaking to the users. Um, it can be a good idea to, to consider custom error messages instead. Uh, don't, don't tell the user that uh, there is something wrong in table so-and-so with user so-and-so and value five. Um, instead, just print like a custom error and make sure that your, your help desk team actually know what this error means. Um, same, another example is um, if you put in the wrong username and password. In a lot of cases, you will just see, if you put in the uh, correct username but wrong password, you will see uh, wrong username and or password. Um, and instead, 
that's, that's kind of the correct way of doing it. The wrong way would be if I put in the correct username but the wrong password, it would say uh, wrong password. And that, that tells the user that yes, there, there, there is, or the attacker that yes, there is a user in this database with the username Bruna, I just don't have the right password yet. So this is more the privacy part of my talk. Um, consider how much you actually need to log about the user, um, not only because it's nice in general to not store anything and everything about every user of your application, but also consider if your database gets hacked and this information is leaked. And if you store tons and tons of information about every single user, especially without the user knowing, that's bad press. So have a privacy policy and, and let users know how you collect this information and what you're going to do about it and how long you store it for. Um, a lot of users are now starting to actually read these privacy policies when, when they decide whether or not they want to sign up to a service. Um, so for example, the Tor Project website does not log IP addresses at all. Uh, we log all zeros if you're coming from the, if you're using the HTTP version, and we log 0.0.0.1 if you're using the HTTPS. So we won't only know that someone's browsing our website, but we won't know who, um, for how long they're browsing the website, where they were coming from before they visited our site, and so on. Um, the Wall Street Journal, what do they know? Mobile series, who's seen that? None. Okay, so the Wall Street Journal published, um, I think it was about a year ago, they, they, they did, um, some research on, on mobile apps on the iPhone and on the Android, and they tried to figure out exactly how much data are, are these applications pulling from your phone without you knowing about it. Um, some applications, in games, even Angry Birds, pulled your contact list. No one asked for permission to do so. Uh, they pull your contact list, they can read your texts, they can send texts, they can make calls. Tons of information that they shouldn't, just because you install a game doesn't mean that you allow the developers of that game to read your texts, for example. Another argument for actually logging a lot, apart from knowing who's DDoSing your server, for example, is to track users on your site to figure out how they use it so you can improve it later. Um, that can be useful, but I think a better way is just kind of ask the users, do a, do a survey instead. So ask them nicely and they will actually come to you and they will tell you what you need to improve to make a better website. And basically just be honest. Don't, don't keep things from the users. If you have a data breach, go and tell it to the users. Tell them this happened, here's what we need you to do. And um, don't, don't, don't try to kind of hide the fact that you have a breach or that you're actually logging a lot of data. So one example, uh, who picked up the uh, social tag cards earlier? Who's, who's got one of those? Okay, so in your Facebook, you, you've allowed their app, right? Has anyone actually checked to see what you then allow these people to do? Three, so by getting this card and having this app in your Facebook account, it will actually pull your profile info, your content, it will access uh, your data at any time, even after this conference. Um, has anyone actually asked what they're going to do with this data? No one. Um, Another example is this like new online payment service, uh, Dwala. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's, I think it's like for you as customers only, so I haven't actually signed up. But I tried to sign up. Uh, and one thing they require is um, your full name, your date of birth, and your gender. But it's not specified in the privacy policy why they need this information, but it is required to sign up. Um, I've tried to, to ask them about this, and they haven't responded yet. So, so basically, just be nice, be honest with user data. If you do store sensitive information, make sure you encrypt it, make sure you transfer it securely. Um, and that goes for any type of app, even, even mobile apps. 
so let's see, useful resources. Uh, I mentioned the, the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, um, Verbsway. And Agnesio is a uh, tool designed by, uh, I think it's Irish developer, um, kind of help you conduct manual code reviews. It's not so much of, it, it won't actually scan your code, but it's kind of like a checklist that you can go through and you can tick a box. Yes, I'm sure that I encrypt my passwords properly. And yes, I'm sure that I use SSL when transmitting sensitive data and so on. Um, any questions? and uh, Facebook. Um, can you talk about FireSheep as an example? What, what about FireSheep? Has, has anyone heard about FireSheep? Some people have heard about FireSheep. So there was a, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Karen. Uh, Karen works for Tor as well. Uh, we're actually going to give a Tor talk on Saturday, so you can come and listen to that. Uh, a developer who wanted to, he, he was kind of tired of seeing all of these applications or services um, not offering SSL to users. So he created this application that it's kind of very, very fancy, point and click. You sit in a web cafe, you start up FireSheep, and then it will just start to show you, like in the sidebar, who's actually logged into Facebook, who's logged into, I don't know, Twitter before they used SSL. And you can just click on those links, and you can all of a sudden, in the right hand side, pull up their information. You are them on Facebook. You can post as them. You can browse their photos. You can change their relationship status. Um, Hi. It's a fancy tool. Hello. Yes. Um, I have a question about uh, privacy in, in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a general advice for uh, um, a social network, a geo-social network? We're trying to establish something like that. And the, uh, another question, can you reflect something about um, what Pinterest has gone through uh, recently in uh, terms of privacy policies and their users' contents? I don't know if you, if you have uh, any the, information. The last question. Uh, about Pinterest. Sorry? Uh, uh, Pinterest, uh, the um, uh, social sharing um, uh, website online, they have um, okay, I don't think changed, I used that changed one, their actually. policy recently. So uh, the, the, the first question, if you have any general advice for a geo-social network and things to do, basically, as developers. Okay, so stage. what's the, what does this social network do? What do you want from, from the users? Well, basically, we're concerned about the uh, users of the um, coming along and uh, registering with us. We want them to be comfortable with sharing their content, especially mm -hmm. if they are actually sharing where they are. Yeah. I don't know if that uh, could, I mean, if you have anything from your experience to reflect on that. Um, I think in, in general, it's just to be very clear to users what kind of information you kind of encourage them to share uh, so that they kind of are fully aware that, for example, if they share their location, that they are aware that they're doing so um, and that this is information that anyone and everyone possibly can see. Um, Okay. Make it clear. Is there like any, any special software, I mean, or uh, uh, something that you can do to increase security or enhance policy or make it more clearer or something like that? Um, I think use, well, standard use SSL on your site. Uh, okay. but, but I think an example is to just actually ask the users. So if this site is already up and running or, 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 or if you have a lot of people that you know are interested, ask them put together a survey and, and ask the users what, how much info would they actually want on this site. For example, ask people, do you think it's scary that Facebook knows all this information about you? Do you wish that you can take it back? Um, okay, thank you. I think that's like the general advice, yeah. We were talking about security from a website perspective. Uh, how about um, security for the users themselves? How can we protect our own security when going online? For example, you can use the Tor network to protect yourself. However, it's blocked in most um, Arab countries. Um, there's um, uh, uh, 
uh, Hotspot Shield and um, many yeah. other. Um, yeah, I know you don't probably don't like it, but I mean, there's <laughs> no other way to protect how you can access uh, the internet. Um, uh, you know, like protected from the Arab countries or and uh, and many other places. Uh, so, what do you suggest um, for users uh, to use to keep their privacy? I think there's. So, have you heard about uh, H HTTPS everywhere? It's uh, the Firefox extension created by uh, Tor and EFS that will try to, for any site you try to visit that it kind of has a rule for, it will try to rewrite your request from HTTP to HTTPS to ensure that you communicate securely with that website. Sorry? I don't know about that one. Um, as for your tour question, tour related questions and hotspot shield, uh, come to our talk on Saturday and we're going to cover that. Um. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, we, we focus a lot on mobile apps and websites, so we're talking about security from uh, specifically HTTP and HTTPS. Mm -hmm. um, what, what advice would you have for, for if you're developing? Uh, a protocol separate from HTTP. So what sort of considerations? Uh, a protocol for in, in developing a new protocol. For uh, I'm working on a, a peer-to-peer based uh, UDP protocol. Mm -hmm. So what 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 should I consider to make it a secure, uh, reliable protocol? Is it generally the same guidelines, or is there something specific? I think, yeah, so I think that uh, the things that I covered in, in my talk are kind of like very basic guidelines that are kind of good to start with. So like make sure you have like the, the basic things down and then if it's peer-to-peer -peer, then there might be some additional things that you should consider later on. Um, I'm sure we can talk about that in the hallway if you're interested. Um, Thank you. Thank you. In terms of server resources, what is the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? Okay, uh, HTTP means that anything that you transmit, anything you send. So if you go to HTTP Facebook.com and you log on, then your username and your password is sent to the site in the clear. So this means that if you and I are on the same network here, for example, uh, and I decide to sniff the traffic, then I can see your username and your password. Yes, yes, exactly. But what is the difference in terms of performance? In terms of performance, what, what um, using, using HTTPS, uh, so SSL, uh, I think that's the reason why, because it is performance, it is a bit slower, it takes more um, resources on the server. I think that's why some sites don't necessarily consider SSL to begin with. Um, yes. So is it 50% slower or 10% slower? I don't, I don't have the numbers, sorry. Nor a number? Um, not, I think overall, if you consider, if you're actually that worried about speed and not that worried about the security of the users using your application, um, then, then you should probably reconsider, I guess. Okay, thank you. So my question is concerning when a startup is first creating its MVP or the first product they, they want to launch. Sometimes it feels that security is, is not implemented from the get-go. And you can't blame them because basically they, they're in a rush to release the product to get financing. But sometimes by using some products or some frameworks, you have built-in security, part of that framework that would help you alleviate some of the problems when it comes to security. Do you have any recommendation for that? For example, I think in ROR and Django, they have CSRF protection uh, built into the framework. Do you have any other examples for how you can, someone, what, what they should adopt? For frameworks that you can use? Exactly. Does it actually have some of these built in protection against XSS and, uh, and uh, SQL injection? Um, let's see. So the uh, OWASP Open Web Application Security Project, they, they have um, the page in their wiki about XSS. Uh, is, is really, really good, and it has links to libraries for, for different languages that, that you can use that will then check for, for these characters that are often associated with XSS. Um, like I said, if you can't use one of those frameworks, or if there doesn't exist a framework for whatever language you're writing in, then uh, whitelist 
could be an option, like don't, um, for example, don't allow the greater than and less than tags. Um, but there are ways to do XSS without those tags as well. Um, so check out the OWASP page. Um, it has a lot of good resources.